All right, we're going to get started in just a couple minutes. We appreciate you joining. We're going to get started in about one minute. We're going to get started in just shortly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Merit CX presentation. When it comes to your CX program, are you planning an annual or a perennial? I'm Jeremy Johnson a member of the marketing team, and I'll be moderating today's webcast. Before I introduce today's speaker, let me tell you that we are recording this event, so shortly after today's live webcast, actually within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a link to the recorded presentation. The presentation will also be posted on the resource library on MeritCX.com for future reference. Secondly, we value your input, so please feel free to ask questions during this event by simply entering them in the question box below. We anticipate about 10 minutes of Q&A time once the presentation is completed in which we'll address those questions. Next, I'm really excited to introduce our speaker today, Michael Allenson. Michael is responsible for the CX Transformation Consulting Team at Merit CX. Today, more than ever before, senior leadership across every industry is counting on customer experience to be a differentiator that will drive the growth and financial performance of its business. Michael and his team help Merit CX customers effectively leverage a CX platform, expert services, client success teams, and partners to implement dynamic customer experience programs that go beyond incrementalism uh, to deliver game-changing results. Michael has more than 20 years of experience working with companies to develop, implement, and take advantage of customer intelligent programs that help them drive business results. Michael has an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Michael, we're happy to have you with us today. Uh, now I'm going to turn the time over to you to get us started. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and glad to be with everybody today. Um, I am excited to uh, present on this topic. It is a, it's a passion of mine, and I think probably many of you out there, um, you know, we do this. We do what we do uh, not because we're trying to have really short-term results, uh, but rather we're trying to build relationships with customers that last a lifetime. And we want our program to last, the CX management program that we run, to last uh, just as long. We want it to stay fresh. We want it to continue to deliver results for our customers and for our organization. So let me dive right in. And I hope what we'll do today is give you some insight into how you might think about making sure your program stays fresh. So first, what does it take to have a perennially successful program? So first and foremost, it's always having a bias toward action. There's, you know, really uh, nothing gets done unless action gets taken. And 
too often we end up thinking about the insight that we're driving, but the insight must lead to action. And so that's critically important and rule number one. We also have to have a flexible and nimble CX software platform because at the end of the day, our experience that our customers are having, the way we deliver that experience, our people, our processes, everything about the customer experience is changing on a continuous basis. We need to have tools that allow us to change our management programs with that. Journey maps, they have to be an ongoing catalyst for our business and for our customer experience uh, program, not just a static high-level roadmap. This is critical. We'll talk a little bit more about this today, uh, but uh, the journey map should not be necessarily just a standalone thing, but something that you can continually leverage and continues to change as your customer experience changes. Analytics that prioritize activity and the use of resources. Because at the end of the day, we have a limited number of resources that we can use to address customer needs. We want to make sure that we are using them most effectively, both for customers and for the company. And finally, and of course, bottom line, make sure that the CX activity that we do is linked to business outcomes. Because if we want to be able to continue to invest in our programs, we need to make sure that our leadership understands the ROI that they're getting from the work that we're doing already. And of course, that is especially at a time like today where management teams are more focused on customer experience as a differentiator than they ever have been before. So speaking of outcomes, one of the things that we always recommend that you do first is really think about the outcome that you're trying to drive. And when it comes to our customer experience management programs, if we do nothing, it may feel to us like this, this force is just holding us back from success, and we know that some, something is not being done, but we really don't have a sense of what it is that's holding us back and how we should address it. And if you're doing nothing, you probably shouldn't expect that you're going to get much in terms of a business outcome. You shouldn't be expecting that you're going to be driving many results with your customer experience effort. Now, for companies who are starting to try to figure out what that force is, they start to monitor the, what's going on with their customer experience. They're starting to get consistent measures. It started to be systematic. And this is helpful because, of course, it's building an awareness across the organization of what's going on with the customer experience. And, you know, many of us, most of us, are good people and want to do the right thing for customers. So awareness does put us in a good direction, but still we're not taking any kind of systemic action. Um, but when we're aware, we can have a little bit of impact on our business just because people want to do the right thing. Now, when we get to the next level, we start thinking about taking action that is tactical in nature. We know and we're identifying through our measurement and through other sources, customers that are having problems, customers that may be leaving our business uh, because of it or not doing more business with us. And so if we start thinking about plugging those holes, figuring out who needs help and uh, giving them that help, we're working on giving them that help. We're working on loyalty and retention at that point. And at that point, we can expect we're starting to really get a bump up in terms of the outcomes we're trying to drive. But really what we're doing is protecting our existing revenue. So at the next level, we start to see companies that are taking strategic action, that are looking at the insight that they get across the business, looking at uh, where the opportunities are for improvement and trying to do continuous improvement that helps in various parts of the customer's journey that they have with you. When they do that, then you're starting to really work on growth. And that's when you can start to see a, a significant bump in the outcomes you're driving because you're not just protecting the revenue that you have, you're growing it as well. And finally, at the highest level, what we have are businesses that are driven by advocacy, that they're doing such a good job 
and not just with em- with customers, but with employees too, where everybody understands what the business is about. It's attractive to both customers and employees, and in that sense, people are advocating for you. You almost don't even have to advertise the business. That is at the highest level, and when you get to that point, obviously you're at a place where uh, you're really the the business is almost propelling itself. So you're getting lots of results now. This is important as we think about and uh, within Merit CX, we have a CX maturity framework we call CX evolution, and it reflects this progression. And what I just described to you in terms of the, what it feels like in terms of the outcomes you're driving, that lines up well with uh, our uh, maturity framework. And crucial in that is that it helps you understand how we can go uh, from where we are and how we can improve because we have a broad benchmark that allows you to understand what the next step should be. But why do we care? The reason we care is because it's all about the business outcomes that we're able to drive. And at the top of this scale where you can see the companies that get to the level of being enculturated, uh, they are having three times the success at driving uh, consistent increases, improvements in financial performance and in customer retention. So they are much more successful. And in fact, 87% of companies, according to our global benchmark of 5,000 companies, are performing in that bottom half of that maturity curve, maturity continuum. And what's interesting, and we talked about uh, the loyalty and retention, that's happening at this respond phase. When you really start to get some momentum in your business is when you start getting to the phase where you're doing strategic improvement to your customer experience. So that's super important. So now I want to sort of shift a little bit and talk about, well, how do we get that done? Ultimately, and I mentioned this, rule number one is it's all about driving action. And our CX measurement, our monitoring, our analytics, they should always drive to at least one of these two types of actions that I've got here. Either one-to-one customer engagement that is focused on driving loyalty and retention, or strategic improvement that's focused on driving growth among existing and new customers. So, and that aligns well with those, those elements that I showed you within the curve in terms of outcomes you're trying to drive. So, when I talk about this today, what I want to talk about is several approaches that we're doing. And, you know, it's about these functions and how they can help you accelerate what you're trying to accomplish in both of these areas of action. So first, we'll talk about prediction and what we're doing in that area and how that can really accelerate what you're doing in terms of one-to-one customer engagement. Um, the learning that you get there can also feed into what you may be doing in, in terms of strategic improvement. We'll also talk about true driver's analysis and spotlight in combination and how that can help you create a real continuous improvement loop. And then we'll talk about the importance of journey analytics, what you do with your customer journey map, how do you continue to keep it fresh, and how do you use it as a catalyst to help drive your business. And, of course, what you learn there while you're learning at the strategic level, that can also help you understand things to do at the individual level as well. So let's dive into prediction. Dive into prediction. So first, before I talk about what we do in prediction, let's talk about something we learned as it relates to that in terms of our CX evolution framework. What you see is when we talk about the way companies are responding to customers individually, what we see is that there's about almost two-thirds of companies that are doing basic follow-up with customers, but many of them are not doing a, an integrated approach to that across, the comp- across their company. Another 22% are doing follow-up to customers and have it fully integrated across the company. Just a very small percentage of companies don't just respond to problems. They anticipate them with customers. They don't even need to be told. 
uh, they know and they're responding. And 3% of companies not only respond and anticipate problems, but they also anticipate future needs that may not be a problem but an opportunity. And these 4% of companies, those are the companies that are getting to that highest level, to that level of enculturate or close to it. Um, companies that are doing the integrated follow-up, that's just what you get to when you get to respond and to standardize within our framework. So what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to drive to that upper level of that framework. And prediction is actually a tool that will help you do just that because it is all about anticipating problems and anticipating needs. So most companies that we work with, uh, you know, they, they do a variety of uh, VOC surveys. Uh, they do a, a number of touch points. And at the, at the end of the day, the companies that we work with and across the industry uh, are challenged to identify all of the customers that need help. Imagine a company with 14 million customers, and they only invite maybe 23% of their customers to participate in uh, a relationship survey. And imagine then that their relationship survey only gets about a 6% response rate. So at the end of the day, they're only talking to about 1.4% of all of their customers. And so obviously, you know, 200,000 responses, it's still not a small number of responses. And we may be identifying a number of customers within that that need help because they have a problem, uh, they've in, encountered some things that they don't like in dealing with the company. But at the end of the day, that's just 1.4% of them. There may be 60 times as many customers that need that kind of help. So the opportunity is, what if we could drive exponential visibility increase? What if, there we go, now it's going. What if we could use what we've learned from those 200,000 responses in order to be able to predict among the invited customers what they might be feeling and what needs they may have? That's a 16-time increase in visibility of those customers. What about if we could bring it back to the entire customer base? Well, then we get a 70-time increase in our visibility into their needs. So this is the opportunity that prediction presents. And at the end of the day, what you know, what you don't know is hurting you because we know customers are making decisions about whether to stay or leave, whether to buy something more or not. Uh, and we may not be hearing from them at all and know where there's an opportunity to increase our business or drive uh, retention and loyalty. So the traditional tools that we have, they really aren't enough. And why aren't they enough? Well, you know, many of us have some, some great data scientists that might be working in the organization uh, but ultimately, uh, what we need to do is we need to operationalize those models. So what we need is an integrated solution that allows us to build predictive models, to refine those predictive models over time, and use them to continually feed to our CX management systems so that we can deliver the help to those who need it most and where it is going to drive increased retention for the business and it is going to uh, uh, give an opportunity uh, to really drive to uh, uh, give an opportunity uh, to really drive a significant ROI. So those are the things that we want to do uh, as we take this to the next level. So we created something we call Prediction CX, um, and it is designed to address these needs. So here's how this works. What we do is we have typically start with a survey or some other data that we may be collecting from the voice of the customer. It may even be survey data or other data, VOC data, that we don't collect with you, but you have uh, and have collected elsewhere. We put that together with all of the organizational big data that you may have uh, in your data banks. Um, and it could be things like 
uh, data on customer interactions with the call center. It could be things that you have in your CRM system in terms of what kind of products or services they may have purchased. Um, any data about uh, the customer in terms of uh, demographics or in a B2B setting, firmographics. Um, it could be transactional data. It could also be financial data that you may have on customers. So we put all that together and we put it through our Prediction CX engine, uh, which uses a, a best-in-class approach to doing prediction using uh, an ensemble framework model that looks at many, many different predictive approaches to come up with a blended model that gives you the best result possible in terms of predicting an outcome. Then we will have a list of people that have various probabilities to know whether they may or may not uh, leave and no longer be customers. Or in, the, in other cases where it's an opportunity for share of wallet, that may be the outcome as well. So when we look at the kind of outputs that we get from a predictive approach like this, um, the uh, individual level predictions we're getting uh, include a, a predicted outcome, which tends to be from a cutoff on the probability that we will set. Uh, we have the opportunity to set in the system uh, based on the relative accuracy at different levels of prediction. Um, and then we'll get the actual probability itself, as well as the combination of items in their data set that led to them having that probability prediction of leaving. From that, we are able to feed that into case management tools, which is really important because that's where we're taking that one-to-one -one action. We could even have some where, uh, where we learn that the, the opportunity uh, in terms of return on investment may be smaller and it may not be worthy of expending uh, all of that energy that may, and the resource that may come with a one-to-one -one follow up, where maybe we want to do some one-to-one -one personalized, uh, mass personalized emails through our marketing automation system. But either way, it gives us the opportunity to do one-to-one -one action. Remember I mentioned that one of the other things that you can do with the outcomes of prediction is it could feed into some strategic improvement. And where that comes in is having these common churn recipes. So knowing that you have uh, the same combination of questions and answers or uh, fields and, and data points uh, that are causing many people to have a high probability of churning. And so you may find that of all the people that were predicted to churn, that maybe 20% of them had the same recipe, same combination. Well, you're going to want to send that combination of things to an action planning tool and get a team of people who will understand the different dimensions involved to take a look at it and see, can we change this? Can we make it so the hole doesn't even come to the bucket because we've made it either that this combination of things can't happen or that you've improved something in some, in some way around a process or around an offering, whatever it may be that makes it so that doesn't happen anymore and you don't put customers at risk. So that's pretty powerful in terms of being able to make those changes. This gets you to the level of being able to anticipate customer needs and take action. Now, why is this the best practice approach? It's really a combination of three things. One, it's making sure you've got the right technological solution in terms of doing technical solution in terms of doing uh, an ensemble approach using computing power to increase the speed of being able to do it. Combining with an expert services team, a team of data scientists that can look, sure, look and make sure that what you're putting into the modeling is not garbage in and that what you're getting out is, not, uh, is a good quality model outcome and not garbage out. So you really got uh, the combination of advanced tools that help you go faster and more effective and smart analysts that help you make sure that you got quality uh, in and out of the process. And finally, 
it's nothing unless it drives to an impact. And that's where you've got to drive both individual level and that strategic level change that can come from what you learn. Now, let me move on to the second piece that I mentioned, which is true driver and spotlight. And the real focus here is about creating a continuous improvement cycle, being able to not just do one strategic, one off strategic improvements, but have a whole plan around how you do continuous improvement over time. So when we think about this, ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to drive a business outcome. It could be revenue growth. It could be retention. It could be reducing our cost to serve, or it could be even driving reputation. We want to bring that back to the customer outcomes that we measure, which might be NPS or the underlying likely to recommend question, overall satisfaction, some use customer effort score, purchase intent or repurchase intent, and you know not just likely to recommend but actual references. Those are things that we can measure from customers as outcomes. And we have shown that these outcomes tend to lead to business outcomes, and we can figure out how that happens. But the question is, how do we move the needle on these customer outcomes? Usually, we have either in our relationship surveys or in uh, uh, periodic uh, deeper dive surveys, we will have some diagnostics. We'll have some maybe overarching customer experience diagnostics, like those top four. Um, and then we'll have some uh, relationship metrics that often represent different parts of the customer journey. And so what we want to be able to understand is where do we take action? And, uh, and this is the level where we want to take that action, but the question we have is which of these should we be taking action on? What kind of impact can we expect on a customer outcome by taking action on these? What issues do we need to address to achieve the targeted improvements? And how should we go about getting it done? So if you think about this in terms of an approach, our approach on Spotlight and, uh, and the suite of things that I'm showing you here is that it includes five key steps to success. Whether you're using our tools or anybody else's, you want to start with a key driver analysis. And we have our own proprietary true driver analysis approach, TDA, that helps you get that done. Secondly, once you have the, the drivers and you, rel and you understand the relative impact that each dimension of your journey, your customer experience journey, can have on the customer, um, you need to identify where are the improvement opportunities. So you want to create some performance improvement planners that allow you to put uh, compare the importance versus the performance that you're having on those elements. You want to simulate the Im impact that you may have by making improvements. Uh, you want to be able to prioritize where you should be taking action. Four, you want to determine where are the segments of opportunity. So if we've identified what we want to improve, the question is what's unique about those who we need to make improvements with. And finally, we need a tool that allows us to carry this through to the finish line once we've identified what to fix, who we need to address in terms of fixing it and what their situation is. Then we need to actually be able to carry that through and get teams to align behind those solutions. So how do we do that? And what I'm showing you today is where we are going with our platform. And uh, it includes a front end that includes our true driver analysis, which is going to allow you to specify a model in terms of an outcome, like overall satisfaction, and in terms of an outcome, like overall satisfaction, and then look at, the, at the, each of the individual uh, elements of the customer experience that may be uh, influencing that outcome. Once we have that information, we can carry that through and get an assessment of the relative importance of these drivers. And, uh, and uh, uh, what we can see and what the output provides is a relative percentage that each one is contributing to the targeted outcome, which is often 
something like overall satisfaction or likely to recommend, which is part of which derives to NPS. And the, the value of having these percentages that we get from true driver analysis is that we can say, well, first of all, these will all add to 100%. And we can say that post-launch support at 18% is twice as influential at pre-launch support at 9%. And so that helps us understand the relative importance of these things. But when we carry it forward to the, to the graph on the right, that's our performance improvement planner, where we're putting the true driver analysis results on the y-axis, and we're putting our performance on the x. That allows us to understand what are those things that are more towards the top left that are opportunities for improvement. These are places where the dimension, the part of the journey there is important and where we are performing less well. So those tend to be the places that uh, we can improve. At that point, we want to be able to get to a simulator that allows us to understand what is the potential impact we can have. And so we have our observed percentage on each one of these things, and we want to simulate by being able to put in a number that helps us understand, well, if we increase post-launch support to 40, what's that going to do to all of the other measures? Because, of course, there's some uh, collinearity between them that makes them move in concert to some extent. Um, and then how does that flow through? So if we understand uh, what each customer is worth, we can understand if we're able to move the status of a customer, we can calculate what kind of impact will that have on our bottom line. And that's crucial and critically important because if you can generate a business case, you have a much better chance of getting people across the organization to get behind it because it's clear why they should do it. So once you have that, you want to be able to then identify and this is through our Spotlight tool, you want to be able to identify where are opportunities, where are customer segments, where there's an improvement opportunity. So if we identified that pre-launch support was what we wanted to improve, we could look and see who is rating us low for pre-launch support. So in this particular example, what you can see is we might identify somebody who has a particular product um, they have not taken a particular option and a second option they didn't take. And in this case, we have you know, a total of 2,223 2, respondents out of a total of 125,000. So just 1.8% of these customers. So in this example here where we were targeting churn, we found that 11% of all of the churn, so the 486 out of the 4554, that is 11% of the churn is coming from just 1.8% of the customer base. If I knew that and I knew I could potentially reduce my churn by as much as 10%, if I figure out how to fix this combination of products and options, that's pretty powerful. That is a huge opportunity to have uh, a, really a massive ROI if you can fix it. So that's really valuable in getting people behind a solution. And then you want to carry that through to an action planning tool because you may want to be able to get members of teams across the organization to participate. And so by doing that through an action planning tool, they can work as a team on identifying solutions. So that's our continuous improvement approach. Now, the last piece I want to talk to you about is journey analytics. And this is really a big deal because I'm sure everybody listening here uh, probably has been hearing journey mapping, journey mapping, journey mapping, journey mapping, journey mapping, journey mapping. Journey mapping. It seems like it is the word of the day in our industry. Everybody is talking about doing journey mapping. They're doing it with external partners, they're doing it internally, they're learning how to make it an ongoing process. Uh, it is a very hot topic and uh, not everybody has been successful. In fact, there's been more people who've been, who don't feel they've been as successful than people who do with journey mapping. So 
Why should we care about this? Back to our CX Evolution benchmark study. One of the things that we learned out of this study is that uh, companies who are changing their processes, um, uh, we find that you know most companies uh, are really focused around operational efficiency as a primary target. So we have 19% who focus on operational efficiency and don't consider customer impact. 30% start with operational efficiency but consider the impact on customer. 32% balance the two and look at them equally at the same time. Just 10% of companies start with, well, what's important to the customer? and build a process that's efficient and effective around those customer needs. And as you might guess from what we talked about before, um, the companies that are getting to the top there, the companies that start with the customer, they're the ones who are more likely to be reaching that highest stage of enculturate uh, and driving consistent improvement in their business outcomes. So as we carry that forward and we think about journey mapping, because journey mapping can be the tool to identify, well, where do we need to make those improvements? Where do we need to think about the customer first? Again, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, start with your journey mapping and thinking about, well, what do you expect to be the outcome? Because if you don't go into it with the expectation and understanding across your organization that you are going to drive action, uh, you probably won't get it done after the effort is completed. So questions you should be addressing as you're going through your journey mapping. Which moments of truth present opportunities for my business? How much value can be generated by making these improvements? And how hard will it be to get accomplished? Because sometimes the thing that uh, looks like it's the biggest opportunity might be really hard to achieve and maybe we should start at the next one down, which might be a lot easier to achieve, but have somewhat less outbound opportunity. So how do we go about doing that? And this is really crucial, which is that we want to be able to, just like we were talking about with our continuous improvement, this is a similar, uh, a similar capability, and we want to link that journey back to the business outcomes. So we may have all these major steps in the journey, and once we do that, we get to our PIP chart, where we identify those top opportunities. And uh, at that point, what we want to be able to do is do something where we build the business case. And it might be that we find that something like this, a five percentage point increase in problem resolution performance is worth $126 million in reduction at of at-risk revenue. That is a massive opportunity uh, in order to, uh, in order to uh, really invest in this improvement. And the way I typically recommend to our clients that we should be uh, addressing uh, journey mapping is that you should treat it as if it's a portfolio of opportunities. It's not about doing a one-time map and having that be the guidepost but rather find out where there's opportunities for improvement, value them, and figure out where you should invest first. Go and make improvements around that. Go show the ROI that you've achieved. You may not be able to get the full 126 million here, but if you could get even to 20 million, it might take you two, three, 400,000 to get it. But if you could get to 20 million in improvement, that could be just huge, and then that gives you license to go do the next one and the next one and the next one. And you choose these from your journey map so that you can continue to make improvements that make a difference for customers, make a difference for you to make improvements that make a difference for customers, make a difference for the business. And, of course, what does that mean? It means that your journey map is actually evolving over time. So don't have a static map journey map continually, figure out how it's changing, and use the map to drive that change. Don't let it happen to you. You get yourself into the driver's seat in terms of evolving that customer journey. So, 
So what's the goal of your program? Is it about that doing nothing and just sort of standing by and feeling the force against you? Is it, you know, getting a monitor and building awareness? That's often important for people who are at the beginning stages of implementing customer experience programs. Are you getting tactical? You know, some, some early stage companies, they need to really focus on uh, driving retention and loyalty. And in fact, that's often a place where they can show an initial ROI that gets leadership to buy in at a greater level and commit to the next stage. Are you getting to strategic or driven by advocacy? We know that when you get to this level, that's when the results start to pour in. So ultimately, we want to get here. We may not be there yet. We may not be ready for that yet. But understand what it is that you are trying to accomplish and figure out the right tools and the right combination of things, uh, initiatives you should have in order to get there and get everybody on the same page uh, so that the expectations don't outstrip what you're able to accomplish. The perennially successful programs, they focus on actions that help customers and propel this customer centricity. That's how you climb this ladder. It's all about action. And finally, you know, come back to the start, where we started here today. Do you have a CX management program that is always has a bias toward action? Do you leverage a flexible and nimble CX software platform? Are your journey maps a catalyst for your business? Do you leverage analytics in order to prioritize and really get the most out of the resources that you're using to improve CX programs? And then are you making sure, are you bringing in all that internal data about customer value, whether it's current products and services and revenues, or even a lifetime value calculation if you have it? Are you bringing that in to your platform so that as you make changes, you can continually talk about what kind of return you're getting on the investments that are being made? That's crucial. So if you want to learn how to better use these principles to create a perennially successful program, I hope you'll give us a call. With that, I'm going to close out uh, our conversation and turn it over to Jeremy for some Q&A. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michael. We appreciate your insights and thought leadership on the on these topics. And uh, we do have a few questions that we're and we have about ten ten or so minutes where we can address these questions. And there there's a couple that came in, Michael, that that are around prediction and then journey mapping. So I'll just kind of keep them on topic. Um, on the prediction side, uh, here's a question. We have a separate team in, mar in the marketing group that does prediction. How is what you are describing different from that? Yeah, good question. And this is one that uh, I often hear uh, from companies that we're talking to about prediction. And uh, what we're doing is not, uh, it's not, it's not uh, you know, rocket science when it comes to uh, the prediction tools itself. Our tools are cutting edge. They do use computing power to get there faster than some of the other tools that are out there. Uh, but we may not be getting drastically different results than what you're getting. We may be getting there faster. Uh, but the real opportunity, because when you look at uh, these organizations and, you know, the question sort of refers to, you know, someone uh, that is in a different group. One of the things that we see here is that there's different silos, and those silos haven't been brought together. And in that sense, uh, they haven't operationalized uh, the results of the prediction effort. And, uh, and we view this as a plus, not a, uh, not a conflict. So if we can add these tools in and make them work with the existing knowledge that's there and often sitting in another silo, that can be the key to operationalizing this and driving a return on this and driving a return on those, uh, those modeling efforts. And I challenge anybody out there uh, when they're looking at those other modeling efforts to ask, what kind of return are you getting today in terms of the impact on the business? And what's the opportunity that's still left on the table? If your answer to the second question is it's significant, then we should be, you should be exploring how you can break down that silo 
and bring that modeling effort into your CX management platform so you can access that value. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to remind everybody, if you have some questions, uh, please feel free to, to put those in the answer box and we'll try to get to them. Okay, so the next uh, predictive question is, how long does it take to operationalize a predictive model? Yeah, um, so there's really two components of operationalizing a predictive model. Um, well, maybe three. The first, of course, is having a good session that helps to identify what are the various uh, uh, elements that you want to bring into uh, that predictive model. And we have some templates for different industries that we use in terms of the kind of information that we'd like to have. Um, but, you know, often it takes a, a, a kind of a discovery call to figure out well, what are the unique elements that exist uh, with a particular client that we want to make sure we include. Um, but once we have that information, really there's two more steps that have to happen. The first, which can be long or short depending on the quality of your data and, uh, and you know, how many systems you may be using, uh, is really the, the, um, uh, the ETL process for the data. So uh, transforming the data, loading the data, um, being able to make sure that it is clean. Um, you know, when we work with companies that have uh, established a solid data lake and really brought together many of their data sources, this is much easier. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, we're still not quite where uh, that's an easy process for most companies. Once we have uh, the data put together uh, across the different sources that we have and clean, uh, we are able to uh, then uh, do the modeling. And the modeling can be done fairly quickly in a matter of a couple of days. Um, that's what we've achieved with the speed in this platform. Um, so that's really what, what tends the, the key steps. Uh, oftentimes that first step may take as much as a, a week to identify those data sources. And getting the data sources varies greatly in terms of the ability to acquire them. Um, but then once we have that data, it can be as little as a couple of days to get the data loaded and uh, put together. Um, it can be as much as two or three weeks uh, to get that done. So you typically have a, a timeline of about four weeks with some variation depending on uh, the availability of data sets and the cleanliness of data sets. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have another one here. Do you have any examples of companies operating at the top 3%? Well, there's a, there's a few examples that I think uh, uh, we all probably understand. And, you know, I've often been asked the question, you know, can you go from, can you become an enculturated company or do you have to be born that way? And, you know, I would, uh, I would cite the example of Apple as a great example of a company that uh, is at the top. Um, you know, it's one of the top two categories there. Um, and one of the things that you see that is common in companies like that is that, you know, if you go in, if you, if you talk to any customer, if you talk to any employee, and frankly, if you talk to just about any non-customer, they know what the company is, they know what it stands for, and they know how their ethos governs, governs everything that they do. And it's around some customer value, some cultural value. And, uh, and you can walk into any Apple store and every employee exudes that brand. Um, in fact, in companies like that, you often don't even have to incentivize people to do the right thing because inherently they know what to do. A couple of other examples that are good examples of that, and you find it at Ritz-Carlton is another good example of it. Another example, I'm not quite sure they're at the very top, um, but they certainly are close if they're not, is somebody like a Chick-fil-A, uh, where, again, uh, where, again, very, very clear what they stand for, who they are, uh, culture that cuts across the organization, and, uh, and you know, very clear to uh, customers, employees, and prospects uh, who they are. Okay, Michael, we have one last one that we'll take, and it's kind of a long one. 
what's your experience in breaking down the old on-prem silos of sales, professional services, and support to build out a new structure with different roles and responsibilities? And how do you go about this at the onset? Yeah, you know, that that is the challenge, and, and I'll speak to it both from the standpoint of from what we do and also from what you're trying to accomplish and the different tools that you have. Because when we built out um, uh, the CX Evolution Framework, we have six core dimensions that underlie it. And one of the things that we realize that companies need to accomplish is it's not all about what we do. So only two of those dimensions, which are how you respond to customers, customer response, and information are two of the six dimensions. Those are the two where we really have the core of our services that we provide. There's another four key dimensions, including uh, the employees, the way you hire and train employees, uh, processes, the way you develop, uh, document, and spread the knowledge around processes, the structure of your organization is the fifth one, and then the underlying culture of the organization is the final one. And it is those six that we see that are key to moving companies up. And in the structure category, you see that the companies that are at the top have reorganized themselves, broken down those silos. And so when I look at how to answer that question, there's, you know, I'll answer it from what we do, and I'll answer it from other things you can do. So other things you can do, we see a lot of companies that are bringing in a chief customer officer. Oftentimes, that is a two- to three- or four-year process of initially the chief customer officer will have little power and influence. Uh, they'll be a thought leader, and but they won't have necessarily authority over groups. Over time, that evolves to where they have increasing authority and increasing influence on the organization. So that's one way and with some of the tools that they put in place where we uh, tend to take action, and we talked a little bit about journey mapping. Journey mapping, when you're doing it well, will have the, the impact of making it clear to people across the organization where the opportunities are for improvement, which often get to breaking down of silos. And so when you can use that journey map as a catalyst, that helps people get to those decisions on their own, uh, you have the opportunity to make gradual change that moves you in that direction. Because ultimately, you know, we don't want to have to have the company get to a place where we've got to bring in some uh, a management consulting firm in order to blow up the structure. We'd like to see it evolve over time. And the question is, you know, whether management is behind it, whether they're just talking the talk, or they're actually doing stuff, and and those two examples are ways that you can that you can move in that direction. Uh, the one being, you know, doing continuous improvement and getting people bought in, and the second being uh, bringing in a little bit of structural change around having uh, an office of the customer or a chief customer officer. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Michael. And that concludes today's webinar. I just wanted to thank Michael again and everybody who joined today's call. Uh, and also wanted to remind you that within the next 24 hours, you'll get another a replay link uh, of the recorded prison uh, webcast for today. Again, thank you. Thank you, Michael, and have a wonderful day.